Welcome back to the RC3 on the R3S stage in Monheim. Um, our social media channels for asking questions for the next talks are rc3-r3s on uh, Hack and IRC. The hashtag rc3r3s on Twitter and Mastodon and the Mastodon handle at r3s at chaos.social. Up next is Björn Reitenberg, who is a master's student at the Eindhoven University of Technology. He is a vulner vulnerability researcher for hardware and firmware. And the talk is uh, related to his master's thesis. And he played around with lightning. Yeah, so please enjoy when lightning strikes thrice, breaking Thunderbolts 3 security. It's really great to be here. Uh, this is my first time at CCC, so it's an incredible honor that I can share my research here with you. My name is Pierre Rautenberg. I'm a vulnerability researcher, mainly interested in hardware and firmware security, sandboxing, and uh, virtualization. I'm also a master's student in computer science at Eindhoven University of Technology, and the work that I'll be presenting today is uh, part of my master's thesis. So let's talk about Thunderbolt. Well, Thunderbolt is a high-performance proprietary I.O. protocol developed in 2011 by Intel and Apple. And uh, well, it's PCI Express based and the devices possess what is called direct memory access. Now, I will go into these terms in a little bit, but um, for now you could say that based on these technologies, Thunderbolt is really the first uh, external interconnect that allows use cases such as connecting um, external GPUs to a laptop or connecting 5K monitors um, or accessing high-speed external storage at its maximum performance. Now, the first two versions uh, were mostly exclusive to Max and used the mini display port form factor. Um, Thunderbolt 3 is the first version to be widely adopted among both PCs and Macs, but uses the USB SIEM form factor instead. And, uh, well, thereby it also, uh, aside from Thunderbolt devices, also allows connecting display port and USB C devices. Right, so PCI Express, I already mentioned it. Um, PCI Express is essentially the core technology that allows uh, uh, connecting your CPU to the peripherals inside your system. And it's basically a packet switch network that has many similarities to Ethernet, consisting in this case of uh, four components. So let's briefly uh, go through them. Now, the root complex essentially connects the CPU to the PCI Express network. And uh, the switches in turn provide uh, some means to divide bandwidth, both in the sense of uh, time and uh, actual throughput. Then there's the uh, actual endpoints. And if you're using uh, hardware from back in the uh, old days, then you might be able to use them uh, by means of a so-called PCI Express to legacy bridge. So the endpoints will be mostly familiar to you, um, and they can be anything from a GPU to a USB controller to an Ethernet or Wi-Fi NIC. Now, when a CPU requests data from a third-party device, um, there are essentially two methods to do this. And the first method, which we see on the left, is called programmed I.O. Now in programmed I.O., basically what happens is the CPU issues a read request to the third party device. Now this third party device will um, require some time to gather the uh, requested data. And meanwhile, the CPU will keep polling uh, the status uh, from this device. Now at some point the device will be ready and then the CPU will copy the data from the device into its own system RAM and then move on to the next instruction. Now, um, 
eventually a second method was developed, which is called direct memory access. And that's what we see on the right. The first step in DMA is th that the CPU is used a DMA read command. And um, well, it can immediately move on to the next instruction that is not dependent on the data that's being requested. Now, at some point, the data will be made available uh, by, the, by the third party device. But this time, the device will copy the data directly into system RAM and then raise an interrupt with the CPU. Now, in a way, DMA is, uh, you could say, the cornerstone technology to PCI Express. So, um, for example, if the CPU requests uh, data from a SATA SSD, then the SATA controller will fetch the data from that SSD and place it directly into system RAM, and then finally raise an interrupt with the CPU. Now, DMA is a, fa a very powerful concept, and um, basically only because it puts the burden of copying the data into system RAM on, uh, on the device. Now, from a user's perspective, this is of course great because this means uh, lower latencies and um, much higher bandwidth. But from a security perspective, this could pose a threat. And this was actually the case with Thunderbolt 1. So with Thunderbolt 1, all the attacker had to do was connect a malicious device and then it would immediately get unrestricted read and write memory access, um, which in turn would uh, enable them to access data from encrypted drives and um, even gaining persistent access, for example, by installing a rootkit. Now, DMA attacks are generally well understood. Uh, first started with Firewire back in 2004, and over the years, gradually moved on to PCI Express, uh, including all of its form factors, such as Express Card, M2, and eventually Thunderbolt. Now, when Hollywood wants to show you what a hacker looks like, uh, this is the kind of picture that you will typically see. But what you should be actually looking out for is the person looking like this. Well, the person in the background, of course. So the threat model that we're talking about tonight is free physical access to victim systems, also known as an evil maid attack. And some of the example scenarios that you can think of are, uh, for example, uh, laptops that is locked or set to sleep and they're being left unattended in the hotel room or desktop systems sitting in an office. And at some point, uh, a cleaning crew comes in and has brief uh, uh, unfettered access. So over the years, the industry developed uh, several measures against this so-called opportunistic fiscal access. So let's briefly go through them. First one is really simple. You put a password on your bias. So when the attacker gets hold of your laptop, um, they cannot change any of the system settings. Second one is called secure boot. Um, secure Boot uh, basically verifies the entire boot chain, starting from the OS bootloader all the way to the kernel and the device drivers. Boot Card focuses on uh, cryptographically verifying the BIOS itself. There's full disk encryption. Well, if you enable full disk encryption and the attacker gets a hold of your laptop, well, they could dis disassemble the uh, SSD from it, but they still would not be able to read the data unless they know the correct password. And finally, in terms of Thunderbolt, uh, well, Intel introduced what they call security levels. And security levels are intended to um, protect the entire thing that you see right here. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper in the, into the Thunderbolt security architecture. Basically, security levels is an access control system. So, for example, if uh, you have a Thunderbolt-powered hard drive and you attach it for, uh, to your laptop for the first time, then you will get a pop-up, and the pop-up will let you identify the device. Now, at some point, you will choose to um, authorize the device. And then, when uh, the second time or any subsequent uh, times when you attach this Thunderbolt, uh, uh, hard drive, it will start working immediately without prompting you again. 
Right, so Thunderbolt security levels, they rely on Thunderbolt devices authenticating to the host, and devices do this using the parameters shown right here. Uh, the most important one being the universally unique ID or UUID. Now this number is intended to, like the name says, uniquely identify any single Thunderbolt device in the world. And it's also defined to be fused in silicon, so it shouldn't be easy to change. Right, so security levels is a multi-level system. As a user, you can select any of these in the BIOS. So uh, let's quickly go through them. Um, there's SL0, uh, which means no security, and that's basically the same situation as with Thunderbolt 1. There's SL1, which uh, means that device authorization is based on the UID. SL2 is similar to SL1, but adds what Intel calls cryptographic device authentication. SL3 disables Thunderbolt, but still allows USB-C and display port devices. Now, some newer systems support SL4, which uh, is intended for use with Thunderbolt docks. So when you connect a dock, you cannot uh, connect any additional devices through that dock via so-called daisy chaining. Um, and if uh, you, you're, you're using SL1 or SL2, you get pre-boot protection for free. So essentially that means that at boot time, you can start using uh, your devices immediately and all the other devices will be rejected. Right, so security levels, um, they're mostly known for protecting against DMA to, uh, attacks, specifically device to host DMA attacks. But since it prevents PCIe endpoints from accessing the PCIe domain, um, uh, it protects against a lot more PCIe inherent attack factors as well, such as peer-to-peer -peer DMA attacks and PCIe ID spoofing to target vulnerable device drivers. And finally, of course, TLP source ID spoofing. So um, in essence, security levels is really a powerful and much needed uh, protection scheme. So introducing ThunderSpy. Well, previous research uh, before security levels mainly focused on PCIe level DMA attacks to compromise Thunderbolt security. After the introduction of security levels, they mostly focused on tricking the user into authorizing um, malicious devices. Now, ThunderSpy is a new class of vulnerabilities that really breaks Thunderbolt protocol security, thereby uh, being the first attack on Thunderbolt security levels. And so what we're presenting today is uh, seven vulnerabilities and nine practical scenarios to exploit them. So, the first red step in your research was to find out how Thunderbolt works. And uh, well, Thunderbolt is a proprietary standard. So if you try to look up protocol specifications, uh, you will not find them. And if you try to find uh, diagrams that will tell you what the hardware architecture is like, you will not find it either. So the first thing that we did was uh, dissecting uh, Thunderbolt devices and Thunderbolt equip systems. Now, eventually we came up with this uh, diagram that I'm showing here for future research. So starting with the Thunderbolt host controller on the uh, PC end, um, well, uh, the Thunderbolt host controller connects to the PCH and the DGPU and IGPU take care of generating a display port signal. On the other hand, there's the USB uh, power delivery controller which uh, multiplexes between USB signaling from the PCH and Thunderbolt as appropriate. Now on the device side, um, we kind of see a mirrored version of what we see on the PC. So the Thunderbolt signal comes in, gets the multiplexed on uh, to PCI Express on the one end, and uh, if it's a device with two ports, Thunderbolt on the other, which uh, in turn allows uh, connecting a, uh, another Thunderbolt device or a USB-C or DisplayPort device. All right, so let's have a look at some Thunderbolt devices. Um, we have a look at various Thunderbolt devices starting from simple Thunderbolts to eSATA adapters 
to storage solutions, uh, Thunderbolt docks, and eventually eGPUs. Uh, they were pretty much all the same, but this NetStore NVMe enclosure had a really nice uh, clean PCB layout. So that's why I'm showing it right here. Our prime suspect is of course in the top right corner, um, a uh, Intel Thunderbolt 3 host controller. And um, there's a USB power delivery controller, one for each Thunderbolt port. There's a spy flash, which we'll be talking about a lot more later, and an I2C interface. Now, if you have an electronics background, you probably know what that means. Uh, we could get some information from it. And there's an interface which appears to be JTAG, but to answer your question, no, it doesn't work, sorry. All right, so the uh, Thunderbolt controller. Um, this is really an interesting model because it supports running in both in uh, host and endpoint mode. And it's from the so-called Alpine Ridge generation. So it supports DisplayPort uh, 1.2, HDMI 2.0, USB 3.1, uh, USB power delivery. Now in terms of analyzing how uh, this particular controller works, it's not really an attractive device to have a look at, at least initially, um, because it's a BGA package, so all the pins are on the bottom, and there are no public data sheets. So um, yeah, we had a look at the other chips first. The DPS is really the opposite uh, situation. There's a public data sheet, and you can actually talk to this thing over R squared C, for example, to get some uh, firmware identifiers and the current operational state. And I think there are also some registers in there that allow you to control the output voltage. So who knows what you could do with that. Uh, the spy flash is really much the same. There's public data sheet and uh, well, we dumped this content and we found that it stores the Thunderbolt 3 device uh, controller firmware. Uh, when you dump this firmware, you will immediately notice a section called the DROM, or the device ROM. And this device ROM stores all the parameters that we uh, saw on the previous slide. Now, of course, the most important question is, um, is the UUIE in there? And the answer is yes, but only two out of eight bytes. Still, we would like to know whether we can change any of these parameters. So, is there a cryptographic signature in there? Well, the answer is yes. There's a public key and a signed digest. Um, changing the public key doesn't really work, so the fingerprint is likely uh, being stored somewhere in silicon. Now, our second question, uh, remains unanswered because we would like to know whether we can change any of, this, uh, uh, of these details without breaking the cryptographic signature. So what is covered by the signature? Well, not the DROM. Basically we found that we can create completely arbitrary device identities like the one shown right here, um, made by Defender totally legitimate, which of course makes no sense. What's more interesting is that, uh, for example, you would expect the vendor ID to be tied to the vendor name and the other way around. And during our research, we found that this is actually not the case. And basically you can enter arbitrary values for any of these entries. All right, so I had another look at the Intel white paper on Thunderbolt 3 security. And there was this interesting section on the unique ID. And uh, it said, and I'm reading off the screen here, every Thunderbolt 3 controller has a unique ID fused in silicon during production. Now we already know this statement is not true uh, because we can change two out of eight bytes. But there was this interesting emphasis on Thunderbolt 3. So I had a look at Thunderbolt 2 controller firmware. And uh, well, to answer your question, yes, that's the UUID. It's there in plain text and no, it's not covered by any signatures. Now, what's more interesting is that it turns out Thunderbolt 2 devices can 
uh, spoof or clone Thunderbolt 3 device identities. So what does that mean when you can clone identities? Well, remember in our example, we had this uh, Thunderbolt powered hard drive, um, but this time uh, the laptop is uh, set uh, uh, to sleep or is screen locked. Well, in this case, uh, this is not really an issue because the Thunderbolt powered hard drive was already authorized by the user. So when connecting, it will uh, uh, start working immediately without prompting the user. Now the attacker comes in and tries to uh, connect their device. Well, of course, the attacker device will have a completely different identity. And so the system will deny Thunderbolt connectivity. Also, the laptop is set to, uh, is, is locked or set to sleep. So the attacker won't be able to authorize their device. Now this is in theory, how this protection scheme should work. But during our research, we found that we can actually clone uh, identi identities from one device to the other. So all the attacker would have to do is get a hold of one of the user's pre-authorized Thunderbolt devices, clone its identity, and then uh, finally gain access to the laptop, even uh, uh, if it's uh, set to sleep or screen locked. Right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the device controller firmware. We have a jump address on top, um, but what's more interesting is there's a secure key dictionary. So when the user is using SL2, um, this section stores the secret keys that maps to the host controller UUID, and it's there in plain text. Now there's the DROM section, which we've discussed uh, earlier, and the PHY configuration. There's the public key and the side digest, and what turns out to be the USB power delivery firmware. So this is really interesting because that means that uh, the Thunderbolt host controller and the uh, USB PD controller share the same spy flash. And finally, there is a, what I like to call scratch pad section that temp temporarily stores firmware updates um, for uh, firmware updates initiated from, from the host. Right, so let's have a look at some uh, Thunderbolt equipped systems. We have a look at Thunderbolt equipped systems from all major vendors um, across five generations of Thunderbolt controllers, starting from Falcon Reach on Thunderbolt 2 all the way to Ice Lake on Thunderbolt 3. They were pretty much all the same, but this Lenovo had a really a nice and clean PHCB layout, so that's why I'm showing it right here. Um, if you've ever opened up a laptop, most of these components will be uh, familiar to you. Um, but of course, the most uh, interesting components are in the top right corner. Starting with the uh, Thunderbolt host controller, a dual port version in this case. Um, the TPS, um, slightly different version that we saw on the devices and the Windborn spy flash, which we'll be talking about in a bit. Now for the host controller, the key questions are, um, uh, well, first there is uh, the option to change security levels in the BIOS. And so this kind of seems to suggest that the BIOS stores the security level state, but we want to know whether this is actually true. Now, when the user uh, selects either SL1 or SL2, this requires storing device UUIDs. And so we would like to know where this device ACL is being stored. So we had a uh, closer look at the host controller firmware. And uh, essentially it was very similar to the device firmware, but there are a couple of important differences. The first one being um, there's no security key dictionary. And there is a uh, list of um, uh, allowed devices, UUIDs. So this is really interesting because um, when the user selects SL2, this means that at boot time, device authorization still happens based on the UUID only, which kind of seems to contradict Intel's claim. Now there's the DROM. Uh, again, the PHY configuration and all the remaining components that are the same. But there was another important difference. 
um, we found that it stores the host security level configuration. And to answer your question, yes, it's in plain text, and no, it's not covered by any signatures. So all the attacker would have to do is patch the host controller firmware to, for example, disable Thunderbolt security entirely, or re-enable Thunderbolt connectivity when it was uh, disabled by the user. All right, spy flashes, um, they're really interesting devices and usually support some kind of write protection mechanism. Now this particular wind bond uh, we found in a lot of samples that we had access to. And uh, well, this, uh, this model supports five uh, types of write protection. And uh, one is called one-time program. Now one-time program essentially turns this spy flash into a read-only memory. So from that point on, uh, data, the data that is stored on the spy flash can no longer be changed. Now in the footnote, it says special order, but we found during our research that a lot of samples that we had access to still appear to ship this kind of support. So as an attacker, uh, this uh, opens up a new uh, attack factor because basically, what the attacker could do is um, exploit the previous vulnerability to disable Thunderbolt security entirely, and next uh, exploit this vulnerability to disable Thunderbolt security uh, permanently so that the user could never re uh, reactivate Thunderbolt security ever again. All right, so to summarize, um, Basically, there are two attack methods. So the first attack method uh, requires brief access to the laptop to reprogram the host controller firmware. And this only takes uh, under five minutes. It does not require to access to any of the uh, user's Thunderbolt devices. Now, the second attack method is kind of the inverse. So it does not require access to any of, uh, to the host controller firmware but only requires brief access to any of the victim's uh, pre-authorized Thunderbolt devices. Now the impact is really the same for both. So uh, the attacker could get unrestricted read and write uh, access to system memory, um, access data from encrypted drives, and uh, get persistent access by exploiting uh, vulnerability six or installing a rootkit. All right, so let's have a look at uh, how attack method one can be used in practice. So what we have here is a Lenovo P1, which was purchased last year. And as you can see, it's in sleep mode. Yes, it's been locked. So um, I don't know the password. And the password isn't empty either, as you can see. So that's all good. What we're gonna do now is turn over the laptop so that we can reach the back plate. And we unscrew the back plate. Right, there we go. So now I'm going to attach my spy programmer, which is a device called Bus Pirate. And it allows me to interface with the spy flash that is storing the uh, Thunderbolt controller firmware. So attaching the bus pirate to my attacker laptop. And now we're going to use a tool called flash ROM to get the firmware from the spy flash. Right, so now I have a dump and I'm going to feed that dump to a tool that I wrote, which is called Thunderbolt Controller Firmware Patcher. And so as you can see, apparently the Thunderbolt controller was set to security level one, which is the default security level on all Thunderbolt laptops. And I'm patching it now to an insecure state. And uh, so as you can see, it says SL0, which means all Thunderbolt security is disabled. Now we're going to write back the firmware to the spy flash. Now this might take a bit because flash ROM will be trying um, various methods to program the spy flash. And 
as you can see, eventually it will succeed. Okay, so um, now we've written our custom firmware to the spy flash and we're detaching the spy programmer and uh, putting back the backplate onto the laptop. Turning over the laptop and uh, opening it up. Now, as you can see, it's uh, still up and running. We still cannot get into the laptop. Um, and here I'm attaching my Thunderbolt based attack device. Now what you see here is a device that will be attacking the uh, laptop and we're going to use that device with a DMA attack tool called PCI Leech developed by Ulfrisk. And here I'm uh, loading a uh, kernel module into the memory of the laptop which allows me to bypass Windows lock screen. We're entering no password, and there we go. We can get into the laptop. Thank you for watching. Right, so let's have another look at Thunderbolt security levels. Um, this is how it's defined, and uh, well, let's have a look at what it, what we found it to mean. So starting with SL1, uh, device authorization is based on the UUID. Well, this UUID, it's not really so unique because they can be spoofed. And no, the UUID is not really fused in silicon. SL2 um, stores um, secret keys on the spy flash. Sure, that could work, but uh, they're in plain text, so they can be cloned. For SL3, um, well, SL3 disables all Thunderbolt security. Um, that could work, but the attacker could reprogram the host controller firmware to disable Thunderbolt security altogether. There's SL4, which was really puzzling to us because all the attacker would need to do is unplug any existing devices or just pick another Thunderbolt port. And finally, pre-boot protection. Uh, well, pre-boot protection has no effect because all of the security levels are essentially broken. All right, so if you're feeling adventurous, uh, you can uh, try any of these tools that you saw in the demo yourself. I've published them on my GitHub repo. Uh, the first one is the Thunderbolt Controller Firmware Patcher, and the second one is called SpyBlock, which, let, which lets you uh, configure on flash write protection. Quickly moving on to affected systems. So all Thunderbolt equipped systems uh, shipped between 2011 and today are vulnerable. And this especially applies to all PCs released between 2011 and 2018 because they are fully vulnerable. All Macs running Windows and Linux uh, using Bootcamp are fully vulnerable as well. Now, some systems providing kernel DMA protection, uh, which we'll be talking about in a bit, are partially vulnerable. And if you're using macOS, Please keep doing so because um, systems running macOS are also partially vulnerable. So if you would like to check whether your system is vulnerable, um, have a look at our uh, tool spy check or follow the manual of verification steps on our website. Right, so Intel's response to ThunderSpy was what you could say quite underwhelming. And uh, essentially what they suggested is uh, kernel DMA protection. Now kernel DMA protection is an opt-in uh, DMA remapping mechanism for Thunderbolt devices. And according to Intel, all you need is uh, a recent, Windows, uh, uh, recent version of Windows 10 or a recent version of the Linux kernel. So Let's have a look at how that works. Well, normally when a device uh, does DMA to the host, 
um, it does so directly to the IO additional region in kernel space. With kernel DMA protection, there's an IO MMU in between. And so the uh, PCI Express endpoints, including those in Thunderbolt, uh, would not be able to uh, read or write outside the uh, uh, memory range that is uh, signed by the IO MMU. So all in all, it sounds like a sound strategy, but what Intel didn't tell you is that this is a partial mitigation only. Specifically, it only mitigates vulnerabilities 426. And yes, it prevents attacks via DMA, but it does not prevent uh, vulnerabilities 123 from being exploited, um, which leaves the system open to, well, what is called bad USB style of attacks. Also, kernel DMA protection requires IOMMU and BIOS support. And this BIOS support um, during our research we found is only available on some systems released since 2019. So all the previous uh, systems uh, starting from 2011 to 2019 do not support this kind of protection. So no fix from Intel, so essentially what they're saying is, well, if you bought a new, uh, if you bought a laptop in the past nine years, just buy a new one. Well, obviously that wasn't the answer that we had hoped for. So um, we had a look at the question: What is actually needed for the system to support kernel DMA protection? And it turns out it's this list of components. So um, let's briefly go through them. First, there's the IOMMU. Well, it turns out that most systems uh, since Haswell um, ship with an IOMMU. Uh, the DMAR table, well, if the CPU provides an IOMMU, uh, the firmware also ships a DMAR table. We need a system capable of running uh, either of these recent uh, OS versions. Well, obviously this is the case for all Haswell systems and newer. And then there's this uh, UEFI support, uh, which apparently is not uh, present. So we had a look at what this UEFI support actually means. And it turns out that we had to take a look at the DMAR table. And in the DMAR table, there is a flag which denotes which DMA remapping features have been enabled. Now for kernel DMA protection to work, all we needed to do is um, uh, assert two bits, uh, one for enabling interrupt remapping, and the other uh, is uh, called uh, DMA control platform opt-in. And then finally, uh, chain loads the OS boot loader. So that's what we did with ThunderSpy 2, which is not an attack, but two methods that bring kernel DMA protection to roughly six years worth of systems. Uh, the first uh, method uh, is called kernel DMA protection patcher. Uh, you can find it on my GitHub repo. Essentially what it does is, um, uh, well, uh, patching uh, the HCPI table uh, using a, a UEFI module. It's OS agnostic, so it works with both uh, recent versions of Windows 10 and Linux. The second method, um, if you're using Linux, um, basically comprises manually patching the DMAR table, and you can find the steps to do so in the guide uh, that I linked right here. Now, in terms of protection, uh, the protection level is similar to officially supported systems at OS runtime. It does not protect against boot time attacks, but the good news is that screen locking and sleep modes are covered again. Linux users will soon have another option as we're working with the Linux kernel hardware security team to develop kernel level uh, mitigations. Um, meanwhile, Linux users can still use uh, KDMA P patcher. Um, if you do so, we would recommend to uh, sign the uh, UEFI extension using your own keys and for additional security, um, probably combine it with measured boot, um, uh, using, for example, TBM-enabled TPM prop or heads. Right, so let's have a look at how kernel DMA protection patcher works in practice. 
This is a Dell XPS 15 purchased in 2018. Now, when we look in MS Info 32, we see that it is running Windows 10 20H2. And since it's a 2018 model, we see this laptop does not support kernel DMA protection as expected. So I've pre-compiled KDMA P patcher and will now copy it from a USB flash drive. There you go, that's the E of high image. Opening up a command prompt. And now we're going to mount the EFI system partition to the drive letter T. Navigating to the Microsoft boot folder. And we're copying the KDMA P patcher image. And finally, we ensure that the KDMA P patcher gets loaded first by renaming the Windows bootloader and renaming KDMA P patcher to the original Windows bootloader file name. Right, so all done. We're now going to reboot the laptop. Okay, so now in the top left corner, we see KDMA P patcher at work. It has enabled both the interrupt mapping and DMA control platform mapped in flags. We quickly log into Windows and we have another look at MS Info 32. And indeed it says, Kernel DMA protection has been enabled successfully. Right, so let's just attach a uh, Thunderbolt 3 SSD, like this one. There we go, it connected. So just for fun, we will now copy over some large files to the SSD. Now, as you can see, there is no performance degradation. And we're now going to safely unmount the SSD. Oh, that was a bit too early. Trying again. All good. Okay, so we're now going to lock the screen. And now we're going to attach our Thunderbolt attacker device from demo one. And next we're going to, to attempt to perform our DMA attack against the laptop. Now, Windows has detected what it calls a drive for DMA violation. And so that means it caught us reading outside the memory range assigned by the IO memory. So kernel DMA protection is working as intended. Right, so um, UEFI support, what does it mean? Well, essentially it means sending a flag in uh, the DMAR table. And that's what we're doing with Thunder Spy 2. So we're all done. Right, so what's next for the future of Thunderbolt-based interconnects? Um, well, basically two issues remain unaddressed. So um, regarding ThunderSpy, there's vulnerabilities one, two, three. There is actually no means for the user to distinguish between forged and legitimate DROMs. So a device could be looking uh, okay physically, but uh, internally could still have been tampered with. And then there's key, uh, kernel DMA protection, which Intel proposes as a replacement of security levels. Well, kernel DMA protection does pr uh, protect against DMA attacks, but um, it does not uh, protect against any other PCIe inherent attack factors.
such as spoofing arbitrary PCIe IDs to target vulnerable device drivers, or spoof TLP source IDs um, to hijack transactions. And so both of these issues, um, they will most likely affect USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4. And actually for Thunderbolt 4, we know that Intel now requires uh, vendors uh, to implement kernel DMA protection as part of their vendor product uh, certification scheme. So the good news is that if you buy a Thunderbolt 4 laptop, uh, you will be guaranteed to have kernel DMA protection. But unfortunately, backwards compatibility likely means that both of the issues um, uh, that we mentioned here still remain unaddressed. So potential avenues on uh, mitigating these uh, remaining issues, starting with the uh, Thunderbolt, uh, Thunder Spy vulnerabilities, essentially everything is in there in the firmware um, regarding the public key and the signed digest. So if Intel shares the uh, uh, digest scope, either the firmware or the device driver could uh, verify the firmware authenticity. And there's kernel DMA protection. Um, my proposal would be to allow all devices on boot for practical reasons, but at OS runtime, initially uh, disable all new DMA devices. So essentially no route them using the IONU and then uh, require screen unlocking and explicit authorization from the user. And then finally, only then assign an IO memory range. Now for uh, kernel memory safety uh, issues, uh, one could use virtualization based security. And I think Microsoft is currently working on that with uh, kernel data protection and I could see the learner's kernel doing the same uh, soon. And finally, well, uh, to prevent TLP source ID spoofing, uh, one could implement uh, source ID verification similar to PCIe uh, ACS. And finally, I don't know if anyone from Intel is watching, but if you are, um, please implement a UEFI, UEFI toggle that controls uh, PCIe signaling. And when you do so, please maintain the state in UEFI only. Right, so the takeaway that I would like to give you tonight is uh, ThunderSpy is a new class of vulnerabilities really breaking Thunderbolt security. There is no fix from Intel. So um, yeah, check if your system is uh, vulnerable using either spy check or by verifying manually. Uh, there's the full vulnerability report published on our website in case you're interested in more details. Uh, we've presented ThunderSpy 2, uh, which really shows that kernel DMA protection can be uh, patched onto uh, previous systems that are technically capable but have not received any firmware updates. And well, finally, the future is PCI Express, whether we like it or not. Um, that means, um, well, it, it would, uh, this would enable some very nice use cases. But on the other hand, there are also several issues that currently remain unaddressed. So when uh, new hardware arrives with USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4, um, I hope uh, the issues that we mentioned here uh, will have been uh, addressed. So that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter or just ask me here in the Q&A. Thank you very much for joining. Well, Bjorn, thank you for your very interesting talk on that. I had a quick look um, in the IRC in between and I saw that uh, many took great interest into your talk. And uh, your talk was quite comprehensive, so we only have got two questions left, actually. Um, and the first one is, is it possible to manip manipulate the host controller firmware from the operating system, or did you have to open it up and read Flash directly? Um, yes, it is possible to um uh, manipulate the firmware from the host. And this is actually what the Thunderbolt device and host controller vendors do. Uh, 
um, uh, when they update the uh, controller firmware. Um, the, the, there is a caveat. Uh, you cannot uh, write to every uh, offset in the uh, uh, firmware for right from the host. So in particular, uh, the security level configuration is not reachable from the host. But there is a back door uh, via the uh, TPS, the USB power delivery controller. So in theory, yes, this attack could be done uh, from the host. Um, but of course, uh, you would need to have root access um, or administrator if you're on Windows. Um, so that's that's a different tr threat model uh, than uh, physical attacks. But um, uh, yes, it is possible. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Then we've got another question. Is the memory access completely unrestricted or only in certain regions? Regarding Thunderbolt 1. <laughs> Uh, regarding Thunderbolt 1, yes, uh, completely unrestricted. Uh, at the time, kernel DMA protection didn't exist. Um, this was only introduced with Thunderbolt, some Thunderbolt 3 um, uh, systems starting from 2019. So not even all of them, but just uh, a number. And all the systems before 2019 are guaranteed not to have kernel DMA protection. So that means that uh, if you're either using uh, Thunderbolt 1 or Th Thunderbolt 2 or 3 with security levels, uh, you're vulnerable to ThunderSpy. Okay, thank you for taking the time and preparing this talk. Thank you for coming virtually over here. Um, also, lots of thanks from the IRC. Um, I'm told the reaction is broadly positive. And I, I would like to wish you very much fun on the remaining RC3 and hope to uh, ha hear from you again. Your, your talk was great. Thank you. Thank you for joining.